Hi everyone, I'm Pratish, and I'm here to talk about Malin, which is our work which constructs pre-processing ZK snarks with universal setup. This is joint work with Ale, who's here, Yun Song, who also might be here, is there. Uh, Mary, who is, I think, in London right now, Noah, who's also in the audience, and Nick at Berkeley. Okay, the paper is available online, so if you want to take a look, go ahead. Okay, so let's dive in. So, as Ali already mentioned, uh, before we talk about universal snarks, let's take a look at uh, you know, circuit specific, uh, uh, snarks which have circuit specific setup. So, let's say I have some circuit and I want to prove that you know, I know some secret witness, witness which satisfies the circuit. To do so, um, I would use an argument system for circuit set, as Ali already mentioned. And this consists of these three algorithms, right? So, you have your setup algorithm. You have, which this, this thing takes uh, in a description of the circuit and produces uh, circuit-specific proving and verification keys. You have your proof, proving algorithm, which takes in a circuit-specific proving key. And if you have a witness, gives you a valid proof. And finally, you have your verification key, which uh, takes in a proof and checks whether or not it's a valid proof. Right? Um, and I already mentioned some of the nice properties that we have for today. Like with Snarks to from GROT16, you get very fast verification and relatively fast proving um, but the problem is that, you know, the setup algorithm needs to be run by a trusted party or via some sort of expensive MPC ceremony. And even worse, you know, as Ali mentioned, if you're using a circuit-specific setup, you have to rerun this um, setup algorithm every time you change your circuit. So even if you modify it a tiny bit, you have to rerun the entire very expensive MPC ceremony, which is a logistical and operational nightmare, right? So. The new goal that we want is what's called universal setup. So we want to be able to perform, you know, the trusted part of the setup just once, uh, just you know, independent of any individual circuit. We just take in the maximum size of the computation that we want to support, and we get universal proving and verification keys. And the idea is that once we have these universal keys, we should be able to do circuit-specific preprocessing in a deterministic manner. So what this means is that. So after we do this universal setup, we take our universal proving key and the specific circuits, so C1, and produce circuit-specific keys uh, for proving and verification in an entirely deterministic fashion. And we can do this for any number of circuits that we have. And the idea is that now, because this process is, is deterministic, anybody can go ahead and um, rerun the pre-processing step and check you know, whether the result is correct, whether the parameters were generated correctly. All right, so this is our goal in this talk. So what we do in Marlin to, it, to you know, work towards this goal is we have three contributions. The first is we provide a methodology that you know, explains how to construct um, these knocks. This is one of the paradigms that uh, Ali mentioned, right? And how, what, this, what this paradigm looks like is that we have a compiler which takes in two components, so an algebraic holographic proof and a polynomial commitment, which is extractable and produces your pre-processing snark with universal SRS. All right. Um, the nice thing about this compiler is that you know, this modularization is really beneficial for A, understanding the construction, but also you know, if you're a snark designer, you can go ahead and focus on improving each of these components individually. And what the compiler theorem guarantees is that as long as you satisfy the requirements of the compiler, you can just plug in your very optimized component and you'll get out a secure snark, which is like zero knowledge, sound, all the nice properties that you want. Okay, and actually if you look at all the exciting works that have come out over the past year, such as Sonic, Plonk, Malin, uh, Supersonic, what their core contribution really is, is in optimizing one of these two components. So you'll hear about, uh, I think, how, you know, about these optimized components later today. Okay, so our compiler is exciting, but it's not so useful if you don't have ingredients to plug, it, plug in. So what we do, and also, also do in Marlin, is to construct some of these sufficient ingredients. The first thing that we construct is uh, AHP for R1CS. Um, and also, we extend the KZG10 polynomial commitment scheme, which is used, for example, also in Sonic, uh, to fit in the requirements of our compiler. So, and when you plug these into the compiler, what you end up with is Marlin, which is a pre processing ZK SNARK for R1CS, which has universal setup. Okay. So this is all nice, but it's not really super helpful if it's just a, you know, a theoretical construction. So what we do also is provide an implementation in Rust uh, that's available at this um, URL. And basically this, uh, it performs very well, as we can see quickly here. 
Uh, we compared it, uh, we compared our Marlin implementation with the state-of-the-art uh, circuit-specific non-universal pre-processing SNARK, which is GROT16. And what we found was that for the relevant parameters, like you know, proof size, prover time, verify time, we're at most like an order of magnitude away from you know, the state-of-the-art scheme. So proof size is like 6x or something, prover time is roughly 10x, verify time is like 4x off, and I think all of these numbers will only shrink as you know, people optimize the two components, the commitment and the AHP. All right. Um, we weren't able to compare with you know, Sonic, which kick-started this entire area of universal SRS research. Uh, because I mean, we, I don't think we found uh, implementation of the fully succinct variant. Um, there's also another concurrent work, Planck, which you'll hear about, I think, in the next talk. Um, and the difference between Marlin and Planck is really, in some sense, qualitative. Um, Marlin is good for R1CS, and Planck, it, it works with arithmetic circuits, so it's better when your like, computation or when your system is working with arithmetic circuits. Uh, we haven't been able to, again, compare because I think the implementation only came out uh, a couple of weeks ago. So we haven't done like a qualitative compa uh, quantitative comparison yet. But I think the high level bit is that you know, they're roughly similar in performance. I don't think there should be a massive difference. OK. Um, all right, so that's all I'm going to say about the implementation. In this talk, I'll be focusing mostly on the methodology. Because A, I think it's, uh, you know, the, our construction is a very straightforward and clean construction once you have your two components. So it would be, I think, educational to look at how a snark is actually constructed um, and also, what I, like a slight technical point, uh, our construction really highlights that the key to achieving pre-processing, and hence, you know, succinct verification, is what's a technical term called holography. Like, in retrospect, this connection, and we'll see, like, is in some sense obvious, but, you know, we haven't been, prior to this, able to make this connection. Okay, all right. Any questions? All right, so let's dive in. So we'll proceed step by step, right? We'll first look at each of the components, so the holographic proof and the polynomial commitment, and then we'll see how our compiler you know, combines these two components to get out the snark that we want. All right, okay. So, so the algebraic holographic proof is you know, quite a mouthful. It's two very heavy words. Let's see what each of these uh, adjectives means um, in this context. So at a high level, an algebraic proof is just an interactive proof where the Proof messages have some sort of algebraic structure. Concretely, like in, in, in our formalization, this algebraic structure is a low degree polynomial. So what we do is we restrict the prover messages to be low degree polynomials. You can only send, for example, univariate polynomials that are uh, much smaller than the size of the field. So the prover sends along this polynomial. And the verifier is not required to read the polynomial in its entirety. It can just you know, leave the oracle there, uh, leave the polynomial there, and access, access it as an oracle. It can ask, you know, hey, polynomial, what's your value at, you know, point 10, and the polynomial will tell it. And the idea is that by not reading it, you know, you don't have to pay the cost of the you know, polynomial might be like really high degree, so the verifier doesn't have to, you know, pay this entire cost of reading the entire degree. All right. So the prover sends its polynomial, or maybe a bunch of polynomials. The verifier replies with some random challenge. So here we're working in the public coin setting. So the verifier only sends random messages. And this continues until a prover runs out of polynomials to send. So you go P1 through Pn, and the verifier gives this last challenge. And so now the prover doesn't talk, right? What the verifier does is it tries to query each of these polynomials at some, some set of points that it wants to query these polynomials at. So it makes a query set, right? And the idea is that it asks, say, hey, P1, what's your value at some point Z1? And, uh, and P1 says, my value is V1. And this goes on for all the polynomials. And once the verifier has these evaluation results or query results, it plugs them in into some decision procedure and decides whether or not to accept, right? So basically, at a, okay. So this is, I know, in a diagram, what an algebraic proof is. Prover messages are polynomials. The verifier can query these polynomials um, and make a decision based on whether or not to accept based on these uh, query results. OK. So the properties of this are pretty standard properties of interactive proofs, right? You have um, completeness. So whenever the prover has a satisfying circuit and it follows the, oh, has a satisfying witness and it follows the protocol, the verifier should accept. You have proof of knowledge, uh, which I'll briefly mention, which says that. Whenever the verifier 
um, accepts is the case that the prover actually knows a corresponding witness, right? That has some witness living inside the prover's head. <coughs> and finally, you have a slightly wonky notion of zero knowledge, but all this says is that, you know, as long as the verifier doesn't make too many queries to the polynomials, then it learns nothing about the witness. Um, and we have this like query bounded notion only because that's all we need for our compiler. You could consider more advanced notions, but we don't need them, so we don't discuss them. Okay, so that's nice. So we have now this algebraic proof. Um, but we, you know, we came here for succinct verification, right? What's the complexity of the verifier, right? That's the next question. The problem is right now, the verifier complexity is at least linear in the size of the circuit, right? Because it has to read the circuit as input. So at the very least, you know, it'll be run, running linearly and maybe it does some more computation based on the circuit, so it could even be, you know, more than linearly, it could be like polynomial in the size of the circuit. And that's not what we want. We want to be like succinct, or at most logarithmic in the circuit size, right? That's the goal of the talk, and it's the goal of pre-processing snarks in general. Okay, so what we want to do is in some sense take the circuit out of the verifier, right? And <coughs> how we do this, uh, and, but okay, so we've done this, uh, let's say we take the circuit out of the verifier, the verifier still needs to know what sort of uh, computation is checking, right? Right now it doesn't have any such idea. So what we want to do is, instead of having the verifier read uh, the circuit in its entirety, we want the verifier to just be able to access uh, encoded or algebraic version of the circuit, right? And to do this, this is where the holography comes in. We have some sort of holographic pre-processing algorithm which takes in the circuit and produces uh, algebraic encoding of the circuit. So namely, in our case, it looks like a polynomial representation of the circuit. And the idea is that now the verifier can access these polynomials as an oracle, just like it was accessing the prover messages as an oracle, right? So yeah, now the verifier no longer has a sort of linear dependence on the circuit. So what we do now is, you know, the prover and verifier interact as before, they exchange their messages, the prover generates its queries, and now, instead of, you know, so you, you make your queries as before, you query the prover messages, but you also make queries to the circuit polynomials, right? And based on the results of all of these queries, so all of them, you go ahead and make a decision um, and decide whether or not to accept. Now this is nice because now we no longer have a dependence on the circuit size in the verifier runtime. So as long as your query and decision procedures are you know, independent or at most logarithmic of, um, in the circuit size, then your entire algebraic verifier, your AHP verifier is you know, logarithmic in the circuit size at most, right? Okay, so just to recap, an algebraic holographic proof is an interactive proof where the prover messages are polynomials and the verifier gets to look at the circuit only uh, in some sort of encoded form as an oracle, right? That's the key takeaway from this. And the encoding allows you to get succinct verification. All right. Any questions so far? That was like a somewhat heavy technical portion. Yeah. So no, because the index polynomials are all public, right? Um, as I said, the the pre-processing, sorry, the, sorry, the circuit polynomials, they're the output of. You said that they're in the Corizon bounded. Is there information leakage that also um, uh, prevents the verifier from making as many queries? So the verifier can query, okay, so maybe I should have explained this a little better, bit, bit better. But this pre-processing step is a public step. It occurs offline, information theoretically, um, and it's a deterministic process, and anybody can rerun the pre-processing at any point in time and it, they'll get out the same set of polynomials. And the idea is since these polynomials are any, uh, the circuit is anywhere public, right? It doesn't matter if you query it 10 times or 100 times or 1,000 times. So there's no additional leakage from the zero knowledge found there. Okay, cool, yeah, thanks for the question. Okay. All right, so now we have one of our components complete, right? Let's take a look at the second one. So at a high level, a polynomial commitment is a cryptographic primitive that allows you to commit to a polynomial and then later, you know, <coughs> prove that the committed polynomial evaluates to some point, to some value at a chosen challenge point, right? 
And the idea is that as long as this commitment is succinct the, and the proof is succinct, then this verification procedure is much more efficient. Okay, so let's take a look uh, in a bit more detail. So Paul Lama Pimpin has this sort of setup algorithm which takes in the maximum uh, degree that you want to support of your polynomial and outputs uh, these universal committer and verifier keys that uh, work for any polynomial up to that degree. Okay, and then later a committer can take its committer key um, and commit to a polynomial and provide and send over the commitment to the verifier. Right, and the idea is this commitment is it's supposed to be smaller than uh, the polynomial in its coefficient form, for example. Okay, so you send over the commitment, and the verifier says, okay, I want to know the value of your committed polynomial at some point Z. So it sends over the challenge point Z to the committer. The committer evaluates the polynomial at that point. And then also, it provides what's called a proof of evaluation of the commitment at that challenge point. All right. Um, and it sends over both the proof and the evaluation, and the verifier can, can then go ahead and uh, check the proof of evaluation to make sure that the prover is not, you know, making a false claim about the evaluation. Right. So after this point, what the verifier knows is that, you know, if the proof is satisfied, then the committed polynomial actually does evaluate to the value v at the point z. So the properties that you want of this polynomial commitment scheme are basically the same as, I mean, very similar to what we ha had for the HP. You want completeness, which says that, you know, if the polynomial actually does evaluate to the value V at Z, then the verifier always accepts, right? You want extractability, which says that whenever the verifier does accept, um, the commitment actually, you know, in some sense contains a polynomial um, of degree at most D that has this, you know, this relation. And finally, you also want hiding, which says that as long as the verifier doesn't make too many queries, it learns nothing about the polynomial beyond like the evaluations. And this hiding, this you know, this query bound is necessary because if you make, I don't know, up to, you know, if you make degree D queries, like these many queries, then you learn all the coefficients via Lagrange interpolation or whatever. Okay, so these are the properties that you want. Uh, and this is like the very simple notion of polynomial commitments. We've known about this for I would, almost like 10 years now. It's called the KCG10, uh, I mean, the Kate et al. paper in like 2010, I believe, uh, introduced this notion. Uh, but to plug into our compiler, we actually need more properties. Uh, basically, we want to you know, support some of the properties of our AHP. So what we need to be able to do is support like batch commitment, so because each round in the AHP can, um, has multiple polynomials, you want to be able to commit to multiple polynomials at once. You want to be able to commit to polynomials across multiple rounds and then have extractability also hold for this you know, multi-round notion. You want to be able to open your polynomials not at like a single point but at a query set Q. And finally, this is a bit of a technical notion, you also want to be able to have per polynomial degree bounds. Okay, so this is technical. In our, it doesn't quite follow straightforwardly from the simpler notion. You have to do a little bit of work to make sure extractability and all the other properties hold when you have these additional properties. Um, but you can look at the paper if you want to see how it's done. Okay. So now we have both of our components, right? We have the AHP and the polynomial commitment. Any questions about the commitment scheme? Yeah. Uh, maybe just with the mic. Could you use fry in this case to commit to a polynomial instead of using the, um, the um, scheme that you mentioned? Yes, so I think earlier this year from the Matter Lab, oh, earlier this month, last month, I don't know. Um, there's a paper from the Matter Lab folks where they use fry to get basically a transparent polynomial commitment. And uh, if you make that commitment fit the, you know, the interface required by our compiler, so you know have all these properties, then you could plug that in and uh, have a transparent polynomial commitment as well. And, you know, and with fry as the underlying mechanism. Uh, in general, any, any low degree test would work for that. Okay. All right, so, so that's now, so we have, our, we have our components. Let's take a look at how our compiler actually works. And the key idea here is to you know, leverage the holography in the AHP to achieve pre-processing. So let's take a look. So let's quickly first recap you know, what a pre-processing stack with universal setup is. So you have these four algorithms, right? 
you have setup, which produces the universal parameters. You have the circuit-specific pre-processing, which produces the circuit-specific keys. You have your prove and verify, which produce a proof and verify a proof, respectively. And the properties are, again, the standard ones, you know, of completeness, proof of knowledge, and zero knowledge. I won't go over this because, you know, it's a standard notion. You can look at any paper and you'll find these notions. Okay. So let's take a look. Let's look at how our compiler constructs each of these algorithms uh, in a step-by-step -step manner, starting with the universal setup. Um, okay. So in your universal setup, you take in a, you know, the maximum size of the circuit that you want to support, for example, um, and you ask the AHP, hey, this is the maximum circuit size that I want to support. What's the maximum degree of the polynomial sent by either the prover or in, inside the, you know, the pre-processing step? And the HP says, okay, the maximum degree is D. And then what you go ahead and do is you run your PC, your polynomial commitment setup for that maximum degree. And the idea is that now these, you know, these keys will support anything that the HP prover or pre-processing uh, output, right? And you just set these basically as your universal keys. Okay. So, so that's very simple. I, nothing complicated here. You just invoke the polynomial commitment setup, basically. Okay, so this is a bit more uh, involved. So let's take a look at how you would do circuit-specific pre-processing. So now you get in your universal prover key as well as the circuit. And we want, remember, we want this entire process to be deterministic, right? So first we run the deterministic AHP pre-processing, right, which takes in the circuit and gives us like the encoded form the algebraic encoded form of the circuit, so you get other circuit polynomials. And then you just commit to these using your polynomial commitment. And the idea is that these commitments, or this process is a deterministic process, um, if you don't want hiding, it's technical detail. And so yeah, you make these deterministic commitments, and now you're basically a circuit verifier key consists of the commitments here, um, and the circuit prover key consists of um, the index or the circuit that I should be a C. Um, all right, any questions about this? So it's very simple, you just run the AHP pre-processing, take the polynomial set at outputs, and commit to them using the polynomial commitment in a deterministic way. Yeah. Uh, the index is uh, some formalization in the, in the paper. S just think of this as a circuit. The I is a circuit, yeah. Um, okay. You say that the uh, circuit pre-processing is deterministic because uh, if it is randomized, it doesn't help. Can it be proved? Uh, if it's randomized, you have to publish the randomness for the commitment, basically, uh, commitment scheme. Basically, we don't need it. We don't need, because these polynomials are, you know, uh, deterministic generated from the circuit, uh, we don't need for their commitments to be uh, hiding. I don't know if you can prove or not whether or not the I guess like the point of this step is that anybody should be able to rerun the pre-processing, right? Um, and be able to check that the resulting circuit-specific parameters are correct. So if you have some secret randomness, then it doesn't help with that aspect, right? Okay, so that's for circuit-specific pre-processing. I said very simple: run the AHP preprocessor and commit to the polynomial set of outputs. Okay, so let's take a look at you know the big algorithms, the meat of the protocol. Uh, Prove and verify, right? So you have your argument prover and your argument verifier. This one has the witness, this one doesn't. And what you do here is very simple. You run the argument prover, runs the AHP prover inside it, and whenever it produces a commitment, instead of sending the commitment as is, you send along a commitment to, uh, sorry, whenever it produces a polynomial, instead of sending along the polynomial as is, you send along a commitment to the polynomial, right? So the argument prover takes P1, makes the commitment CM1, and sends that to the argument verifier. Then the argument verifier asks the AHP verifier for the randomness, and this continues until the AHP prover runs out of polynomials, right? Um, and then we're done. And then now comes like the query and decision phases, right? So the AHP verifier runs its query algorithm. You get your set of, you, you get your query set. And you know, the argument prover evaluates the polynomials at this query set and sends back the evaluations. And now the verifier can run the decision procedure and decide whether or not to accept. 
Is this sufficient? Does this work? Hmm? Preprocessing is in the previous thing. Uh, it's not, it's not. The preprocessing is in, is, you know, the output of preprocessing comes as input there. Okay, so maybe I'll answer the question myself. This is insufficient, right? Because we have no idea whether or not the prover is giving us the actually correct evaluations. So instead, we have the prover prove to us that these evaluations are correct. And we do this by you know, using the polynomial commitment to produce a proof of evaluation. So we prove that you know, the committed polynomials, these ones, as well as the index polynomials, when evaluated at the query set, result in these evaluations. Uh, so we get our proof, and then the argument verifier, in addition to running the decision procedure, also checks that the evaluation proof is correct. Right? So that's pretty much it. Um, so yeah, this is an interactive protocol. You can make it non-interactive by Fiat Shamir because all these messages are all random. The queries are supposed to be random. The challenges are already uh, random because it's public coin. Um, so, so you can get a non-interactive argument at the end of this. Very clean construction. The idea is use holography to you know, pre-process the circuit, and then instead of sending polynomials, you send commitments to polynomials and prove that their evaluations are correct. Okay. The nice thing is that not only is the construction clean, but all of the properties that you want, like completeness, proof of knowledge, and zero knowledge, they all follow very cleanly from the corresponding properties of the two components, of the AHP and the polynomial commitment. And you also get succinctness, you know, if the AHP and the polynomial uh, verifier, uh, the PC verifier are all succinct. And this is the case for, for example, in Sonic, in Plonk, in Marlin, both of these components are succinct. Okay, um, so that's it. Um, so today in this talk, we saw how to construct these universal pre-processing ZK snarks from these two components of the algebraic holographic proof and the extractable polynomial commitment scheme, right? And in the paper, you can find more details about you know, some of the ingredients that we have. So you can, our AHP for R1CS is in there and the underlying protocol is uh, you know, a cool protocol for evaluating low degree, right? so low degree encodings of the R1CS matrices and we also show how you can extend KZ10 to achieve the properties that we require for the compiler. All right, so yeah, thank you everyone. The paper is available online at this link and the code is also there. All right, is there some, qu okay. Uh, I understand that it's in, in the paper, but it would be great if you could perhaps uh, tell us how you extend the CATE polynomial commitment scheme. Um, I mean because that's what makes the proofs. Can you use your mic? Um, yeah, so it's not the case that you know uh, we extend it and like adding some new proof terms or something. Uh, we just take that scheme and then show that if you want to do the obvious extension, um, like batching proofs or something, then the proof follows through. So uh, it's not it's not not super complicated, but you know it requires some legwork to actually make it work out. Georges, can you pass the mic to the person behind you? Hey, um, so. Uh, it's very nice to have this kind of like um, conceptual framework where you plug in these different pieces and then you get this proof system out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if, uh, if we think that we want to have like conceptual unity between the theory and the actual implementation, is it actually possible to implement this kind of uh, compiler in practice, that you could have like one library and you like just plug in different pieces in different like p places and you get like either Marlin or something else. Yeah, so actually if you look at uh, our implementation, it already has sort of the separation. It's not quite the fully fledged compiler, but the full fledged compiler, but you can, all this is structure, like we have a separate library for polynomial commitments. Uh, the AHP is like a completely separate module within the within library. Uh, I think with just a little bit more work, we should be able to generalize that and get the compiler out. So yeah, I, th I think that, that would be very helpful because then you can just plug in, I don't know, bulletproof-based PC or any other PC and have it work. Yeah. Oh, I think are we out of time? No, 
No, it wasn't about time. I wanted to add that I think from the perspective of uh, sort of practice and developer community, this type of modularity is rather important, if anything, for, for uh, gaining uh, confidence in the security of code that is written. These are rather, mm -hmm. I mean, already uh, we have issues in simple di digital signature scheme implementations. There are much simpler constructions than these. A full SNARK implementation is much, much more complex. So making sure that uh, the implementations that we do have have these conceptual separations into simpler and smaller modules that we can independently verify and fix, uh, I think it's rather important if we actually want to run like uh, sort of uh, serious infrastructure on top of these things. Yeah, yeah, good point. 